Welcome everyone to National Park Service Presents Season 3. It is one of my favorite programs, as I say all the time, because it's my favorite. I really do thoroughly enjoy it. Um, before we begin and you guys get to Ranger Eric and his wonderful presentation on Peter Faniel, I'm going to go over some of the Zoom features. I know you're like, Karen, we've been doing this for a little bit, but sit back and enjoy the lovely sound of my voice. Um, this is an online series that runs every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Um, oh, sorry, excuse me, every other Wednesday from 6 p.m. until the end of April. I believe we're going to April 26th. It covers a whole multitude of topics. Today's focus is on the life of Peter Faniel. Um, honestly, I hear the name all the time, but I don't know much about the gentleman, so I'm pretty excited. Um, when you first joined, you can see that you might have heard a little voice that said, recording in progress. And that's because we are recording. If you come a little late or if you missed a previous um, lecture, you can absolutely check us out on YouTube. We're on the BPL YouTube page um, in our own playlist. So you can absolutely look at that. If you do not enjoy the captions that are kind of popping up on your screen, especially as I talk very quickly, um, you can turn those off yourself. At the bottom, there's a bubble that says CC, and you can click on that and turn them off. Um, some individuals do bring in, uh, bring in, type their own pre pre lecture question, and those have been given to our wonderful moderator already. Um, but if you have questions as uh, Ranger Eric is giving his presentation, feel free to click on the chat button and type them in the chat. Do not be shy. We do ask though, because you know, there's a lot of sides to a complicated history. We just ask everyone to be respectful, all right? That's all we ask. Um, notice when you are putting your question into the chat form that um, you're sending it to either everyone. Everyone is absolutely everyone who signed up for this presentation. If you are sending it just to us, uh, make sure it's sent to, it says hosts and panelists. That is just the people who are speaking on the screen, such as myself. Um, what else we have? Oh, we have the wonderful Ranger Sean um, looking after the questions. And so at the end of the presentation, he will pop on the screen and you'll be able to kind of go through the questions. And I think that is all of my gross admin stuff. Uh, there is one maybe special shout out. Um, I believe my cousins are watching today and I just want to say hello <laughs> and Julie. Hope your eyes are on the road, okay? Only listen. Don't watch this while you're driving home. Um, all right. Without further ado, let's bring the man of the hour. Let's welcome Ranger Eric as he presents uh, the transatlantic life or world of Peter Faniel. Woo! Thanks, Karen. You're welcome. All right. And my screen's sharing already, right? We already got the, the magic of spotlighting going. So... Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Eric Hansen Plass. Uh, my official title is Visual Information Specialist with the National Parks of Boston, but Ranger Eric is pretty much what works and makes the most sense in, uh, when I work with the public. Uh, prior to this current position, I was the lead ranger for what we call the Social Justice Team in the National Park Service here in Boston. It's a team that uh, provides interpretation and programming at Fannel Hall, Fre the Freedom Trail, the Black Heritage Trail, uh, and it explores uh, themes about social justice, about activism, about uh, social change, the pursuit of liberty, the definition of liberty, and different groups fighting and struggling to define what it means to be an American. Um, and I'm the one presenting tonight, but I have to call out that uh, this is the product of a ton of hard work. Uh, from volunteers, staff, other colleagues. Uh, we started this project uh, around 2020 in the middle of the pandemic, looking for things to explore and expand on. Um, and it's kind of been this pet project of mine since then, trying to dig deeper, look deeper, and learn more. Um, because Fannel Hall, the site that the National Park Service, in conjunction with the city of Boston, uh, it, the Park Service interprets it. We work with the city to preserve it, to operate it. Uh, and we know so much about the building. The building is so significant as a place of revolution, as a place of abolition, suffrage, labor activism. All the way to the 20th century, you have LGBTQ rights activists, you have town hall meetings. Uh, it's still used to this day as a public space of engagement 
And if you've never visited, I hope, I hope you do take the time to visit the, the great hall on the second floor of the historic brick building, the original building that was built by essentially a man named Peter Fannel. Uh, so we know a lot about the building. We, he, he's the benefactor of this hall that is expanded. It's been here for over 270 years. Um, but what we really know about the benefactor is quite limited. Um, and on top of that, we know that he had ties to the slave trade. He had ties to goods all across the Atlantic. Uh, but with whom is he trading? To what extent? What's going on? What's at play? Um, and so we've done a lot of research, like I said, a lot of hard work has gone into it. And we're looking to basically take you on a little bit of a tour about the background, uh, the beginning of this journey of exploring you know, what is the legacy of Panel, Peter Fanel? What does it mean? Uh, and then we're going to follow roughly two voyages of captains that were in his employ to kind of get a sense about how complicated and vast this network is that produced, uh, in his day, the greatest amount of wealth in Boston. When he dies in 1743, he is the wealthiest man in town. Um, and it's no small part because of this empire that he amassed through inheritance, through contacts, uh, this huge system. And we're just going to try to scratch the surface uh, of a little bit of this. So to begin this evening, we're going to start on the other side of the Atlantic from here. Imagine a ship just finished crossing the Atlantic. It's February, but the weather's very hot in the sun. It's a far cry for the New England winter that this crew on this ship left behind. When the ship settled into the wide and calm harbor of the Sierra Leone River, the anchorage locations were some of the most ideal that any experienced mariner could ask for. The anchorages of the Sierra Leone offer deep water up close to small protected bays and landing areas. Uh, they were surrounded by thick mangroves, lush highlands rose behind these mangroves, uh, and fresh water would come down in spring straight down. So it was a great place to refit, uh, to get water, um, but also, unfortunately, to trade. Now here on the west coast of Africa, and here we have a, uh, the harbor of the Sierra Leone River entering into the Atlantic. Uh, even this map from 1745, it highlights the anchorages that were so advantageous for ships. And in this case, we're in the winter of 1742 and landing there, dropping anchor in one of those anchorages in the winter of 1742 is the maiden voyage of the Jolly Bachelor of Boston. But the ship's master, John Cutler, this was not his maiden voyage. He's the captain and part owner of this snow, which was a type of ship defining its rigging, uh, roughly looks like a two-masted sailing ship. Um, this, he's the part owner of this ship, and he is no stranger to these shores of Sierra Leone. He already knew the best anchorages in Sierra Leone, and he already knew the minute his ship dropped anchor with whom to engage and start negotiating business. On his ship, we know he had at least English flints by the thousand used for muskets, uh, New England rum by the hogshead, and other manufactured goods that were collected from all across the Atlantic world. Cutler would meet with white Englishmen on small island outposts, one of them is this uh, Il Banana, the Banana Islands, but also with Afro-Portuguese traders in villages on the mainland. Cutler might agree to items such as gold dust, ivory, uh, and cam wood, which was used as dye. It was a local uh, wood grown there. But primarily what Cutler was trading these goods for would be enslaved human beings. For decades, historians have known about the journey of the Jolly Bachelor. It is well documented because unlike hundreds of voyages that took place every year in the 1700s, this one met a disaster that ultimately left Cutler dead here at the bottom of the Sierra Leone River near what's labeled here Foro Bay. And it left a paper trail as a result of this disaster in the court system that we've been able to trace. The Jolly Bachelor would be left floating in the river without a captain, surviving crew members run away and seek assistance actually from uh, the, the men on uh, the Banana Islands, the Englishmen. Uh, they're able to recover her cargo, which in this case are 34 enslaved Africans that were kidnapped. 
they have to sell 12 of them to refit the ship and resupply it. And then the ship arrives uh, in the summer of 1743 at Newport, Rhode Island. When the Jolly Bachelor finally returned, it brought 20 enslaved Africans to Rhode Island and each one of them were sold at auction to wealthy Newport, mer Newport merchants and mariners. These are their names. And these men, women, girls, boys, they were sold off as essentially what was called salvage. The ship was abandoned, it had been attacked, it had no master, and so other men basically rescued it, reclaimed her property, and then by coming into Rhode Island, they brought it into what was called um, uh, at the Admiralty Court, and they condemned the ship as a prize. Um, the ship, the property were sold at auction, and the proceeds went to the owners in one part, the finders in another part, and then the crown in a third part. Cutler was already dead. And when this ship finally arrived in uh, Newport, Peter Fanel was dead as well. But the system by which Cutler and Fanel lived and died by, it was so vast with so many complicit stakeholders that even though these two men who collectively own three quarters of the ship, the trade, the investment of the Jolly Bachelor, even though they were dead, they still in their estate received profit. Other men extracted a profit. When the Jolly Bachelor arrived in New England and sold these human beings in Newport, Rhode Island, for us exploring and understanding this legacy of this Atlantic empire, this is the beginning and not the end. So often historians quote this voyage and then they leave it as, well, here we are, 20 enslaved Africans sold. The proceeds, Peter Fannel and uh, John Cutler's estate. We took this as an opportunity to dig deeper. It was the beginning of our attempts to understand how one Boston family and their ties to transatlantic slavery, even though it's a tiny fraction of the overall massive Atlantic economy in the 18th century, it illustrates how a vast system dependent upon enslavement and exploitation actually worked, where the money flowed, who got what, who did what. So we look at this one family and we get a sense of how this whole system worked, even though it's just one small sliver, and how at the very bottom, enslavement and exploitation supports so much of it, even if the captain and the ship in question didn't even touch any enslaved person or transport an enslaved person. The goods, the products of enslavement from places like the Caribbean, South Carolina, the food to feed that workforce, the goods that that enslaved workforce produced would be on other ships. This is the beginning of trying to understand Peter Fandel's legacy and how it could be framed in so many different lenses. Now, after the Jolly Bachelor case, um, there's just a couple 19th century sources, some things going around. Uh, what we really focused on beginning in 2020 to try to make sense of this story and the larger context, the larger legacy, um, we started with this single letter book that survives that belonged to Peter Fanel. Now we only got one, but it's better than nothing. As a historian, you take what you can get. Um, this book begins around 1737. By 1738, Andrew Fanel the uncle of Peter Fanel and uh, essentially the patriarch of this emerging clan of merchants um, in the 17 teens, 20s, 30s. Andrew Fanel was of uh, French Huguenot descent, came to Boston. His brother, Benjamin, settled in New Rochelle, New York. Uh, Benjamin in New Rochelle is the one that had uh, Peter Fanel, the man we're talking about, but also uh, another Benjamin, a brother of Peter, a number of sisters and brothers of Peter. Uh, Benjamin and his wife Anne die in New Rochelle while all the children are still rather young. They end up going to, by the 1720s, to Boston to live with their uncle. And Peter is the chosen one, the one that will inherit the lion's share of the inheritance. Um, and it's around the time this letter book begins that Peter Fanel is taking over Andrew's business entirely. 
Throughout the 1720s and 30s, we do have some ledger books, some account books. Uh, they're very sporadic. And it does show the changing of an early economy of shipping salt cod, which we'll get to later, in exchange directly for Europe with goods, to something that by the time Peter Fannel has grown up in the system, trained and mentored under Andrew in this system, and then starts taking it over. Because by 1737, Andrew is getting very old. By 38, he dies. Peter Fannel will take it over and be the patriarch of this family and all of its power. And so we went through all the letters that survive, and it's mostly from 37 to 39. Uh, there are, however, small scraps and missing letters because there's earlier historical accounts in the 19th century that reference letters from the 1740s and even 41. They don't exist anymore when you look at the volume. Uh, there are a few small scraps left, but just a tiny handful. Um, and what we did is even though there's so much missing, we had over 160 pages scanned and you know they're all handwritten by clerks that copied the letters that he was sending line by line page by page you know volunteers staff colleagues we all worked together to annotate every transaction piece together who is he talking with who is he trading with where is he sending ships what are the names of those ships who are the captains after a solid year of hard work this is what we came up with a map that shows every region and continent that Peter Fannel or his extended enterprise family had connections, wrote letters, imported goods, exported goods. Every pin is a port that he sent a letter to or received an invoice to or from over the course of from, 17, from the 1720s when his uncle Andrew was running it and training him all the way through the invoice period of the early 1730s that we have. And then finally, the late 1730s, we have letters of him writing to men in the Caribbean, people in Spain, agents in the Canary Islands selling fortified wine. And many, many letters are going to London ordering the most lavish fine goods imaginable. So this is what we have. And you can almost kind of consider it as a snapshot of say 1738, 39, when he is commanding this empire, spanning four corners of the Atlantic world, he dealt in goods and trade with many different regions, different ports. He had agents, relatives, and associates throughout this entire vast area. His uncle left him this fortune, and then he took that, and with that mentorship, fortune, connections gained, and his personal clout and family name, after 30 years of building it, he had the opportunity to create the greatest amount of wealth possible. How did it actually work? Well, I'm going to take the next about 20 minutes to explore two captains that work for him on a couple different vessels and try to untangle, you know, what is all going on that in the end made Peter Fannel when he died the wealthiest man in Boston and was able to build a public building, donate it to Boston. Um, at his own personal expense. And so to begin, oh, and why are they color coded? Uh, basically, they're different regions. So blue are um, areas under British crown. Uh, the red, they are under French. Uh, the Dutch are orange. Uh, Portugal, we have green. Spain, we have yellow. Um, and I won't go too much in the details because this is actually part of a larger feature online that I think Sean will drop the link to at the end that you can actually dig deeper than all the research we've put out in what we call the Atlantic Empire, Peter Fannel. Um, but it shows you all the places he's touched and been involved with and traded. But some of the specific voyages, that's kind of the next challenge is trying to unpack that. And so what we're going to do is start with our first captain named Joshua Boutin. Now, we don't know much about this man other than he shows up in uh, records as a captain who regularly plied a trade between um, Boston, uh, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, down to the West Indies, and back. But as the letters progressed in his letter book, Peter Fannel references Bhutan more and more and clearly looks to Bhutan as a, um, a trusted captain, boots on the ground, to engage in some really important commerce across the ocean by the 1738-39 period. 
So we're going to focus on Bhutan here in 1738, where we have in the newspaper for uh, Boston, March 1st, we have him bound for the West Indies. But when I dug a little more, I found that before he went to the West Indies on March 1738, he had just arrived from New Finland, Nova Scotia, uh, what you would now call the Maritimes of Canada. So in 1737, we have a Bhutan heading to Newfoundland. I accidentally cropped that off. And there, what he's going to get is salt cod. Now, the Fanel fortune begins, and a lot of fortunes of merchants in Boston begin with this salt cod trade. Codfish grew uh, to immense sizes before it was overfished. We're talking hundreds of pounds. Um, and you have two very hot markets for this fish, and Bhutan is going to journey to both of them. First is a market for what's called refuse grade, West Indies grade. Here in Newfoundland, you can get all the reject fish, maybe when they salted it. You know, we have uh, images of it being caught, speared, brought up for processing, laid out on what was called flakes to dry out. Uh, and hardened so you could preserve the protein of the fish. Uh, if the fishermen were too careless, they would punch too many holes in it. If they didn't cure it right, it would fall apart and break. The good stuff would go to Europe and they had very exacting tastes on what quality of cod they would accept. But in the Caribbean, which after we have Bhutan going to Newfoundland, arriving from Newfoundland at New Hampshire and Portsmouth, then not too long later, we have him heading for the West Indies. It's very likely that that ship, even though we don't have a manifest, nothing survives. Uh, customs records from this period in Boston don't exist. It's a pretty logical conclusion that in 1737, September, he goes up for the fall catch and the refuse grade cod go down to the Caribbean to feed the millions upon millions of enslaved Africans working in bondage who are applying uh, the plantations of sugarcane growth. And here we have a depiction of them harvesting. And then here in the lower picture, you actually have a depiction of enslaved labor refining the sugarcane, the juice, down into either raw sugar, the higher quality, the whiter it is. And then you have brown sugars, what you have muscovado. Um, oh, what's the other one I'm thinking of? It's uh, you know, a lower grade browner sugar and then down to molasses. Now, molasses, on the return trip for someone like Bhutan, once he returned, would come back to Boston. And we're looking at probably, if we have the customs records, hogsheads of molasses, possibly rum. Depending on where he went in the West Indies, who knows? If it was a French island, like maybe Martinique, St. Lucia, or another popular place that Peter Fandel had a lot of ties to, Cap Francois and Saint-Domingue, today, Haiti. If Bhutan went there after he got his load of fish, it's a very good chance that he traded for molasses that would have to be smuggled in. Because if it came from a foreign port in the Caribbean, legally there's a duty on it. But oftentimes what happened is, is you would just park your ship outside of Boston and then slowly bring it in on smaller boats or grease the palm of a customs official to look the other way. If it was a British island, there's a good chance that, say, if it was Jamaica, which Fandel also had ties to, they would have brought back um, lesser grade sugar and more likely more rum. Jamaican rum was of high quality um, and it fetched a higher price in other port markets and they could be sent anywhere, not just in North America, but across the ocean in Europe. There's also a possibility that um, he went to uh, St. Eustatius uh, or other islands that were either Dutch, Danish. There's a whole bunch of islands all in the Lesser Antilles that he could have traded, that Bhutan could have traded with on the benefit or account of men like Fanel. Now, Bhutan goes on many of these voyages, but what's interesting is, is after several what you call coastwise trade trading routes between Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, down to the West Indies, back up. He then goes for Europe in 1738. When he sails for Europe, he'll be gone for nearly a year. 
but he definitely lands somewhere around the Mediterranean states. Probably at this time, Bilbao or Cadiz. Now, if he's coming across the ocean this time on a voyage that I know for a fact Peter Fanel mentions uh, in his letters, uh, what you have is um, the high grade fish. Instead of the West Indies grade to feed the enslaved populations, instead, you have a population in Portugal and Spain that at this time in the se middle, middle 1700s um, is so large that uh, because of some uh, drought around this time, Spain and Portugal have a population greater than what they can provide internally for their own grain demand as well as protein demand. Uh, and one kind of added little perk to this kind of economic arrangement where you have all this codfish across the ocean in Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. You also have a lot of Catholics in the Iberian Peninsula that about one third out of the year at least, you're prohibited from eating meat. Fridays, Lent, special feast days, you're supposed to eat seafood, fish. Uh, you have kind of a baked in market and a baked in demand to sell this fish to Spain and Portugal. Also Italy. And it looks like that when Bhutan went out there, a couple different things happen at the same time. And this is where it gets complicated. When the ship heads out, Peter Fennell writes a letter asking his agents. Uh, primarily, uh, they are, I think it's Mess Mrs. Baker. Uh, they're trading houses based in Spain that are Englishmen who act as go-between agents. They receive this New England fish. They try to sell it. And then they will send the ship, Captain Bhutan, to wherever they think he could pick up something of worthy re-import back to the colonies. At the same time, when you sell this fish, if there's a net profit, Peter Fannel will never see hard currency from the profit of selling this cod to Spain. Instead, he will tell his associates. And so, for example, uh, Lori Michael and company, for example, in this snippet, um, he will tell them to essentially send a bill of credit to Lane and Smethurst. So you have bills of credit, IOUs, and essentially Peter Fannel can't sell anything of enough value directly to England, but England has things he wants. For example, he specifically asks uh, for a nice case with silverware, knives and forks with a handsome handle, the best blades you can get. Another time he sends a coat for his sister, Marianne, to be re-dyed in specialty dyes and colors. He wants all these nice fancy things for back home in Boston, but he doesn't sell and can't sell enough to England to, make, to offset the costs. So by relying on agents in Spain, he will get bills of credit to then transfer as payment for something from say Lane and Smethers, his trusted bankers and uh, agents in London. Bhutan also might've gone to um, Italy and picked up what they called Florence oil, olive oil. He looks like he picked up um, a whole bunch of salt from more salt cod back across the ocean, handkerchiefs, linens, different kinds of fabrics, imported niceties that hopefully will sell well back in America. Um, it turns out that in this case, that the sale of fish from Bhutan didn't turn out very well. Some years were good. This year, either the market was flooded or somehow the fish got contaminated, maybe with leaking seawater. It's not clear, but Peter Fandle doesn't get the price he hoped for this load of fish. But thankfully, Bhutan's not his only iron in the fire. There are other ships that he's talking about, and he's not necessarily an investor, a part owner. Maybe he's sending a ship and then the return ship, the ship is actually going to Spain on the account of someone in Spain or England. And when that ship returns back, it's owned by someone from Spain and England, but they're using Peter Fannel as agent to resell those goods and he gets a two and a half, five percent commission. So he has his own ships, his own captains. He acts as agent for other ships and other captains. He might even send goods on somebody else's ship. He asks for insurance when it's prudent, 
Other times, he takes at his own risk shipping goods across. When Bhutan returns, he finally returns to Boston. And at the same time Bhutan returns, Fanel immediately dispatches a number of letters in 1739-40 to people like Julian Verplanck in New York. The minute that Bhutan returned, Fanel starts to write, starts to write about how many handkerchiefs do you think you could sell there in exchange for your buckwheat, wheat and corn, grain that I could then resell maybe back to Spain or as foodstuffs back to the Caribbean? How much Florence oil and half chests do you think you could sell? So you have goods coming in and immediately being redispatched. What do you think will sell? I'll send it to you. Can you send me back 300 bushels of buckwheat on the best terms you can? Um, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, they're quickly becoming a breadbasket, not just for grain in the colonies, but very much the breadbasket for Spain and Portugal as the population explodes and there's drought, and also the breadbasket for that Caribbean economy down there where no one is subsistence farming on small islands like Barbados and Antigua, uh, Guadeloupe, and Martinique. They're only growing cash crops like sugar and sugar cane it's these middlemen like Peter Fanel and his vast empire that's shifting all these goods back and forth. Now, Bhutan will go on several more voyages, but it's interesting because when Bhutan goes on more voyages, it turns out in the end, this voyage worked out okay in the end. He makes enough money to start investing, not just in his own shipping, but also other voyages. And that gets us to John Cutler. Now, John Cutler is born and raised in Boston. His father dies somewhere in the Harbor Islands. The circumstances are very unclear. Um, and he's raised by his uncle, who is a doctor, uh, also named John Cutler. But what's interesting is in, in the 1720s, and this falls in a lot into legend, um, Benjamin Fanel, the brother of Peter. When Andrew dies, Benjamin Fanel is left with, I think, just a shilling, a pittance, virtually nothing. And there's been a lot of legends, wives' tales, kind of, you know, juicy hearsay that suggests that clearly Benjamin did something to anger Andrew, the uncle. Peter was the favorite. And then there's people have gone on to say, well, he has to say a bachelor and never marry because Benjamin angered Andrew so much. What we do know is that Benjamin does not get much of the fortune. He gets a pittance. And he marries a woman named Mary Cutler. Uh, some genealogies claim that she is the sister of Timothy Cutler, the rector of Old North Church. Totally different family. And I think that might have been why it angered Andrew so much, is that this Mary Cutler was more common. However, her father was a respected doctor who grew up in the Netherlands. His original name was de Messmaker, a knife maker in English, Cutler. Uh, but Mary Cutler marries Benjamin Fanel in the 1720s. And her brother, John, apparently after learning how to read write, uh, he followed the path of many mariners. He became a boy on a ship sailing the high seas. Who, who knows where he, he went? There's a whole, pretty much no way to tell. And eventually learning the ropes, quite literally, on how to handle rigging, both your standing and running, how to sail a ship, how to navigate. Eventually he'll make it to mate. And then um, he first shows up in newspapers as a captain coming from North Carolina in 1738. Cutler from North Carolina, bound for Boston. And then we have this advertisement in 1739 Cutler for Africa. Now, digging through the scraps that survive in Peter Fanel's letter book, not much is left anything beyond April 1740, or 1739, I should say. But there's one scrap of paper that says, Brigantine Marianne, Africa, five-eighths. 
Marianne is the name of his youngest sister. And Marianne, uh, because Peter Fanel never married, uh, essentially serves as the mistress of the household um, while he throws parties and entertains and when they show up to church at King's Chapel where they went. Marianne is his sister, his favorite. And here we have a ship named Marianne that will show up by 1740 on customs records that survive in Virginia with 70 Negroes. Owner, Joshua Bhutan and company of Boston. So we've been doing a lot of digging and a lot of poking and prodding. And so often we focus on, well, the Jolly Bachelor, the 20 enslaved African soul. Peter Fanel funded for his brother-in-law Part owner, he had five eighths of this ship. Cutler had at least an eighth. It was customary to have some stake in the game as a captain. Otherwise, you wouldn't treat the voyage with enough seriousness and make sure it got the right price and profit. Joshua Bhutan coming off from the riches, presumably from that European voyage. Bhutan, Cutler, Fanel, and possibly other related members of the Fanel family. Could have been Benjamin, his brother, could have been a man named John Jones, who would, just before Peter Fanel died, marry his sister, Marianne. There were a lot of things, but then finding that scrap of paper that actually said, Marianne, Africa, 5 8 share. In 1739, in August, Captain John Cutler sailed for Sierra Leone. When he obtained as many as 80 enslaved, kidnapped Africans, um, it's estimated that probably 10 died at sea on this voyage. Cutler shows up September 15th, 1740 at Williamsburg, the upper district of the James River. And then about three months later, he clears out of customs with 2,000 bushels of corn, 2,000 bushels of wheat, and he's supposed to be bound for Boston. But then what's interesting is he's um, supposed to be on the way to Madeira, or excuse me, on the way to Boston, but then, quote, contrary winds blew him to the Wine Islands. One account says, Captain Cutler, who sailed out of Virginia last December with a load of wheat and Indian corn, to differentiate corn, maize, corn that we're familiar with because historically corn could have referred to any kind of granule of grain. He was designed for Boston, but was by contrary winds and bad weather, drove so far out of his course that he went to Madeira. From whence he writes to a correspondent here in Williamsburg dated February 13th that he came to a prodigious market when he arrived at the island, which was about the middle of January, the inhabitants all being most starved for want of provision, having received no supplies for some time before, that as soon as he got ashore, he was carried about a town, tied to a cross as they carry the image of our Savior on festival days, with 10,000 friars and boys whooping and hallowing with joy, insomuch that he was deaf with their noise. He sold his wheat at nine shillings per bushel, an Indian corn at six shillings, three pence. Um, haven't done the comp work, but if they're bragging about the price he sold it at, it means it was hot stuff. So then he returns to Boston from Madeira. Kind of a swashbuckling hero. Here's the report. If you were able to see the manifest of Cutler's voyage, he leaves for Africa returns a year later plus a year plus later from madeira you would never see an enslaved african on that manifest but because by sheer luck the customs record survived in 1740 in virginia and of all places he ended up there we now know that he crosses the ocean twice in one voyage on the marianne and when he does show up we have it in plain language the Brig, Marianne, John Cutler, Brigantine, 
part owned by Joshua Boutin, and we know now, part owned by Peter Fannel and Cutler himself. Now, this man clearly is riding high off of his uh, caper. And at the same time, a new ship is being built somewhere in New England by the order of Peter Fannel, a ship that he will own half of, that he will name the Jolly Bachelor. And now we get to the infamous voyage. Where we started, we have Cutler sailing across the ocean in the Jolly Bachelor, leaving Africa November, or leaving for Africa from Boston around November, December. By January, he arrives, and by February, he's engaging in trade. His ship's anchored right there in the Sierra Leone River. And then something happens where either he crosses somebody, some tradesman that feels like he did them wrong, or there were simply Afro-Portuguese pirates that saw an opportunity. But on March 9th or 10th, 1743, or so 42, excuse me, the ships attack, Cutler's killed, rocks are tied to his body's arms, and he's thrown overboard. When the, sh when the, ship, when the ship survivors make it to the Banana Islands, where Englishmen are trading in slaves, other goods, they decide that if they can recover the property, rescue the ship, they could return it to Rhode Island or somewhere in New England, claim it as a prize, and in the accounts, what's interesting is the men that give testimony, the men that quote unquote rescue the ship, they knew John Cutler. They had a long standing relationship that spanned more than just a month prior to his death in 1742. The voyage of the Marianne, and perhaps voyages as a mate, as a boy, preceded it. Also, it's worth noting that before that ship was attacked, it was believed that as many as 84 kidnapped Africans were enslaved and shackled on the Jolly Bachelor. When the ship was attacked, it wasn't an attack to free these enslaved Africans, but it was an attack to steal this property and try to resell it. The white men that rescue, quote unquote, the ship can only recover 34. 12 of whom are sold, two either run away or die, 20 show up where we started in Rhode Island. Now, Peter Fannel, he dies, by the, he's, he's, die, he's dead for months prior to the time that the Jolly Bachelor finally shows back up in Rhode Island. But this system is so vast and so massive that we're dealing with something that is larger than one person, but it also illustrates how this man's capital, this man's influence, this man's empire of goods and contacts and enslavement, it's part of this large system that created the Atlantic world, that created the economy that built colonies like Massachusetts. Fanel is the richest man when he dies. His fortune split among his siblings. Most of it goes to Benjamin Fanel. Uh, Benjamin will then pass it on to his sons, a Peter Fannel and a Benjamin Fannel, who will be uh, implicated in the, uh, the destruction of the tea and the crisis over the tea party. Most of them will be loyalists. Uh, but there's other merchants, John Rowe, John Hancock, dozens of others who employ captains, who employ shipbuilders, who ply the coastal trade between Canso and Nova Scotia and, and Newfoundland down to the Caribbean feeding enslaved populations in return for molasses, rum. You have this, uh, this cross transatlantic voyage where ships like Joshua Bhutan's never touch the coast of Africa, but they're trying to balance out the trade and his investment dollars from his successful voyage with Fanel to Europe directly turned around and funded a ship that enabled Cutler to enslave some 80 Africans and sell 70 in Williamsburg, Virginia. I'm gonna conclude with just a recognition that, you know, we wanted to frame what this meant. Yes, Peter Fannel engaged in direct slaving, but he also engaged in very much indirect slaving. 
And this whole co economy was built on exploitation and enslavement. It was the lowest common denominator, the cheap source of labor that made it all go round. This is the beginning of America. It's this fact that, yes, Peter Fennell had a legacy, built a building, but those enslaved Africans, known and unknown, named and unnamed, also built that legacy. They're the ones that trudged, that suffered, that died. And the cumulative efforts of all these people is a legacy we have today. Where do we go from there? That is the question. It is in our hands now. We have that collective legacy. What's next? What do we do with it? How do we remember it? And how do we understand where we're going? That's why we wanted to go on, on this um, research voyage. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up and leave it for questions. I hope you enjoyed it. Well, um, thank you so much, Eric. That was, you know, a very enlightening and powerful presentation. Um, so do want to get into some questions. Um, there were some that I think have some pretty easier, you know, kind of simple answers and then can get into a little more complex. Um, yeah. So one question was actually, um, during Peter Faneuil's time, did the Customs Tower play an important role in Boston? Uh, the Customs Tower wasn't built till the, uh, 20s or 30s. Um, your customs officials uh, operated out of various rented buildings at the time. Um, and again, we don't even have the records until the 1750s for Boston. We have a couple, a little bit in the 17 teens, big gap, and it picks back up. Uh, but the location of the customs tower, even in the 30s, it's there because it's in the middle of where, even still in the 30s, you had shipping houses, merchant houses, insurance, finance, and that's where the customs house, customs tower ended up in the 30s where it is. Um, it's not a customs building anymore, um, but yeah, so 200 years later, it's built. Um, you touched upon this a, a little bit too, um, but do you know of any other significant Boston merchants of the era who um, had a similar involvement in the slave trade? So again, it's it's one of those things where direct ties it gets it gets difficult but implicit ties the subtax of all these goods feeding and feeding enslaved africans taking the produce of these enslaved africans um it just permeates the whole economy um and like i said you've got later generations um you know the the, the nephews of peter fannell uh john Rowe, john hancock um you have more instances of direct slaving continued in newport and you have things like the legacy of the of the Browns, um, you know, later founding Brown College, um, Brown University. Um, I mean, you have to kind of look at the ledger books and kind of peel back the layers. It's not easy. And at first glance, it's like, oh, he didn't trade. Oh, I guess there's that one time with the 20 enslaved Africans. But then when you dig deeper, it, it's so much more intertwined with the nature of it all. Yeah, no, I uh, definitely doing some of this research. It's it's very, you know, the more you get into the weeds, the more you realize how intertwined everything is. Um, which is what uh, what Marty Blatt just said. So, um, yeah. you know, yeah. that comment as well. Um, so another two two quicker questions. Um, and then um, again, dive a little bit deeper. Um, so do you know where it, the question was? Daniel attend Harvard. Um, so do we know where he, if at all, he attended any college? No. Um, John Cutler's father did in the seven in the 1690s, as well as his uncle, who practices as a physician. Um, they go to Harvard, they're trained, uh, he, he's trained in Europe. His father, uh, Peter, just stays as a as kind of an emerging merchant and shopkeeper. Um Oh yeah, great point about um, the Perkins brothers, James and uh, Handa said, yeah. So um, even after the slave trade, I'm jumping back to the merchants, 
um, even after the, the slave trade was somewhat outlawed or, or um, in even America, you still had merchants that would just go even from America and just do the trade directly between Africa and the Caribbean, skirting a prohibition on importation of new enslaved Africans into America. Um, and they're based in Boston and you have the Perkins School for the Blind. Its direct legacy comes from the Perkins fortune that did engage in slaving. Um, I mean, that, that's a whole, like all of this, it's a whole other research project and presentation. Um, and uh, where were we? Harvard, I, yeah, ha Peter did not go. He just learned, and maybe he did. I haven't even looked at it. So I can't say with certainty. Most of his training though, it comes from direct mentorship from his uncle. Uh, and then taking that and taking it even further. Yeah, and and we'll say I, I also haven't come across anything that speaks of him attending Harvard and kind of the the few small sources that we do have. Yeah, I don't. Bio. Yeah, yeah. Um. So another kind of again, I think an easier answer. Um, do you know where the Faneuil Mansion and elaborate grounds were along Tremont Street? Yeah, roughly uh, where like Pemberton Square, you know, so if you if you know where Center Plaza is off of Government Center uh, and you go kind of through that pedestrian walkway, you come to the John Adams Courthouse and then to your left is one beacon, uh, that big tower. Uh, it's it's in that vicinity um, that he lived and um, it's where he lived with his uh, sister, Mary Ann. And then Mary Ann, um, when she marries uh, John Jones, who is the other part owner of the Jolly Bachelor, he ends up living in that house. Um, and they continue to engage in transatlantic uh, trade. And there are advertisements around the 1740s and 41 that have Jones's name tied directly to also importing Africans who are enslaved uh, for sale right in Boston Harbor um, off Clark's Wharf. So, um, yeah, the, the house would have been just north on Tremont Street, roughly opposite King's Chapel. Great, thank you. Um, so got a couple questions coming in here in the chat. Um, and got a question here. Did Faneuil face any opposition to slave trading in his day? And I think you might be able to elaborate a little bit on that, on just kind of, you know, maybe opposition in, in other Boston or other spaces that would have existed in kind of the, you know, pre so the, America. Yeah. I mean, the, the, in 1700, 1701, there's the, uh, the Adam Saffin case, um, and it prompts a pretty messy legal battle. Um, where an enslaved man named Safin claims that he's due his freedom because he made an agreement with his master uh, that after so much labor, he could earn his freedom. Uh, and his master said, nah, no, nah, I'm good. You, you're not going to be able to go free. Um, Samuel Sewell writes uh, a treatise in 1701 that really critically questions the institution of slavery. Um, and it sparks a conversation. A lot of people feel uncomfortable by it. And then to be brutally honest, by the 1720s, um, Boston is rising so rapidly in its wealth that people kind of stop asking questions, at least in public. Um, you know, the age of Andrew Fannell, you know, becoming this master merchant and his nephew learning the trade and coming of age under his tutelage it's that period that having a household servant was becoming fashionable. Having someone who was enslaved from Africa was just something that, you know, if you were making it, you got. Um, and, you know, the, the, when Peter Fandel dies, there are five enslaved people in his, in, in his estate. Um, John Cutler grows up with an enslaved woman named Hannah, who's identified in his father's will. Um, you know, it becomes this thing that almost is internalized, it seems, by a lot of people by the 1720s, 30s, and 40s. And then when the economy turns down in the 1750s into the 60s, uh, there's an interest in divesting of enslaved people, if anything, because of financial reasons. It's like divesting of trying to pay off debts. Um, and it's only till then, um, and I've done research in other places about this, it's only till then that you have a handful of ens formerly enslaved men actually able to work and know their children and kind of gain the toehold um, in Boston through land ownership. And it later becomes Beacon Hill. Uh, but that's a whole other, literally a thesis and, and presentation. Um, but that's kind of the, 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 the crash course of, of the history of slavery in Massachusetts in the 1700s. 
Um, it becomes internalized and normalized, even though there had been a discussion in, this, in 1700, 1701. Um, and then very quickly after slavery is effectively, um, you know, nullified by the new Massachusetts Constitution and you have lawsuits and people claiming freedom and gaining it in the courts or just walking out, no one being able to stop them. Uh, as, as the institution of slavery quickly ceases to exist as a legal entity in Massachusetts, um, you have people pretty quickly saying in kind of this collective amnesia, it's like, yeah, it's over. It's not that bad. It wasn't like the South. Um, and already there's kind of this collective amnesia about the institution by the 1790s. Um, and it takes that African community, African American community in Beacon Hill to kind of force recognition and, and to be an activist to say, no, really, we're still here and we still need uh, equal access to education and equal rights because we are also citizens and inhabitants. Um, yeah. Um, when you mention that thesis, I will say for the people here, um, that is a thesis <laughs> that Eric wrote. <laughs> and uh, I'll drop the link to that in the chat. For those oh, geez. Questions. Thanks. Yeah, that's a, that's a deep dive. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I do say the question from, from Marty about have you been able to document um, Peter Fennell uncle's direct engagement in the slave trade? Directly, uh, no. Um, have not been able to document it. Um, that would be another place to look. Um, he's very heavily involved in that trade with Canso up in the Maritimes of Canada, today's Maritimes of Canada. Um, he really masters the fact that they're Fre of French descent and they still have relatives in Rochelle, uh, France. Well, if you draw a line straight from Rochelle, La Rochelle, France, straight west, you hit Louisbourg. Um, and Louisbourg is right next to Nova Scotia, and eventually Nova Scotia is English, and before that it was actually Acadia, is what it was called. But you have these two territorial claims of two rival countries very close to each other. And it appears that Andrew and then Peter, they were able to very effectively kind of code switch where they would bring up illicit molasses to Cape Breton and Louisbourg, then change captains and flags and say, oh, it's actually was English this whole time coming from Nova Scotia and then bringing it into Boston to avoid any kind of tariffs. Um, and part of that balance of trade to get that molasses to begin with was all that refuse grade salt cod going down to the Caribbean. Um, because by the time Andrew Fannell was even coming of age, you already have a solid hundred years of plus of enslavement and importation of Africans as well as indigenous peoples to work sugarcane and other cash crops in the Caribbean. Um, and because they're so small and so limited, they're focused on solely a cash crop economy. And so all the food has to be imported. So again, directly, it gets kind of messy because really indirectly, it's part of this building economy and they're building into it and profiting from it. Great. Um, we did also have a question in the chat. Uh, is there I know that this is a difficult thing to quantify, but is there any way to delineate which portion of his wealth was generated from the slave trade in which from the trade of goods? Say that again. Sorry. Um, is there any way to delineate which portion of his wealth was generated from the slave trade in which from the trade of goods? I think the challenge is, again, it's the whole economy is so intertwined and so dependent on having that cheap labor source in the form of enslavement. Um, now, one thing we have tried to kind of poke around at is do like basic back of the napkin math. You and I, Sean, have been kind of playing with this idea of like, okay, well, how much molasses, say, could an enslaved person create kind of on a per capita basis? And then in exchange, how much fish would that result in? And so like, what would be the economic impact of say, we know a, a ship part owned by Peter Fannell sent, you know, 600 quintals of, of fish, you know, 600 hundredweight of salt cod, you know, how many mouths would that feed? How much would that translate to? And then how much economic output would that result in? And that's, it's getting complicated and, you know, we still have tours to do and things like that, but it is something that every now and then I start kind of poking around again and wondering. Um, but when we want to talk about hard, actual direct his money went to a voyage that funded slaving. Um, I am confident in saying that the numbers are at least 200. Um, so if, if you ignore all the complications about how the economy was built on this exploitation and enslavement, um, you have a voyage of 80 in, um, in, on the Marianne for John Cutler, 
80 initially for the Jolly Bachelor. So now we're at 160. And then there's another little tidbit of surviving correspondence between Peter Fannel and his agent in New York, Julian Verplanck. There is, in the 19th century, they cite one of the letters that has since disappeared that asked Verplanck about, quote, an account of Negroes. And digging and digging, we found a, um, a ship owned by Julian Verplanck, as well as a number of de Pasters, who Fanel also does dealings with in New York, a ship owned by those men that arise in Perth Amboy, New Jersey, with 40 enslaved Africans. So now we're looking at 200, plus the ones in his household, um, the people in other households that were part of his family. We don't have names, they're just Negro man worth this much when it's all boiled down to his estate. And it's just this cold, hard, a human beings boiled down to a piece of property and a value. Um, and you know that's why it's, I'm also interested in looking at those 20 names we do have from that auction of the Jolly Bachelor in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, you know, what happened to these people? We actually have names, but what becomes of them? It's, it's pretty hard to tell, but maybe we'll get lucky. Um, but so many more, they're just lost to numbers and accounts uh, in ledger books because they are boiled down to literally being property uh, from the perspective of these merchants. All right, thank you. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, and we'll ask, uh, you know, considering Peter Faniel's life um, and, you know, business dealings, everything that you just laid out, uh, why hasn't the name Faniel Hall been changed? So the hall was donated to the people of Boston in 1742 by Peter Fanel. In fact, Peter Fanel built the building and built a hall on top of it. And then the very first meeting in 1742, the town decided to name it in his honor. It's always been Boston's. It's been a, a, a massive symbol since then. Um, you know, abolitionists, when they met there, when Frederick Douglass spoke there, they knew that they were speaking with such immense authority because it was Fanel Hall. It was where the revolutionaries fought for their freedoms. And here we are trying to stop the slave power. Um, it, it takes on its own status, but it's always been Boston's. And so it's, it's really up to Boston. The city still owns it. It's, it's Boston's gift. It's theirs. This is the legacy we've all inherited both a physical building, but the legacy of this economy and the society is created and the country that's formed as a result of these colonies. It's up to us to decide ultimately what is that, how does that legacy look 10 years from now? I mean, but when it comes to that name, it's Boston's gift. It's up to Boston. Awesome. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, you know, that was a really powerful presentation. Appreciate you. Thanks. I'm glad someone, so many people are enjoying it. Um, and, you know, you dropped the link for the Atlantic Empire feature. Um, there was a, a recent update. So I think some of the drop downs are broken. We're working on fixing that. So you can't expand more details about every port. Um, but stay tuned because we will be working on another feature that really dives in on this voyage of, especially John Cutler, you know, the man most directly tied to the slaving and the involvement of the fannels um, and try to try to build up and share more of this this research. Um, and by all means, visit Fannel Hall and, and talk with the fantastic staff that works there. Um, you know, we love to have conversations and explore, you know, what what is our legacy? What is our shared legacy and what is our shared future? So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Eric. I will uh, turn it back over to Karen to close this out. Oh, my goodness. I'm just taking it all in. That was absolutely incredible, Eric. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sean, for all of the wonderful moderating. Um, because honestly, you're not going to get that kind of quality if it was me. So as you can tell from the wonderful comments, your research, both of your research, it, it's incredible, honestly. And um, thank you so much. So. I just want to thank everyone for joining us on this wonderful Wednesday evening. I know it's chilly, but luckily we're, you know, watching from a computer. Um, and hopefully you can join us again in two weeks when I believe it is uh, Boston, an underground railroad hub. Um, thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Oh, and please fill out the survey when it pops up on your computer. Thank you.